What's up, everybody? Thank you so very much for joining. A shout out today for those of you who are watching online from various online platforms across the Bay, the country, and the world. I'm just so happy you're with us. A shout out to those of you who are with us in our San Jose campus. I am so delighted that you too are with us. I am psyched. Did you hear me? I'm psyched about this brand new series called Coming Home. And today we're going to talk about knowing when to let go. Now, let me tell you, there's a couple of reasons why I'm super, super psyched. And it all leads towards the fact that I think that God is going to do something really supernatural for those of you who are participating and walking with us through this series. Okay, here's the first reason. Uh, there are more, last time I checked, there are more than 600 people connecting with NBCC, both locally and nationally and beyond, who are participating in our prayer and fasting season. When you get that many people participating and praying and fasting, you know that God is going to respond in an amazing way. Secondly, only my staff knew that several months ago, or longer, we selected that the passage that I was going to teach for, from for this season was going to be the prodigal son. It is not a common passage to preach for from moving into Easter. So check this out. I was totally shocked. When the Honorable uh, Shalina Brown, who closed out our Thrive series last weekend, and we hadn't talked, so she didn't know what I was going to talk about for Easter and this series moving to Easter, when she announced that her text was the prodigal son. My gosh, that is just this huge sign from my perspective that uh, this, this particular series is uniquely ordained. I think God's going to do something, again, as I said, supernatural in the lives of those of us who are participating. So you know what that means? That means don't miss a week. And if you're watching online, if you're showing up in San Jose, make sure you're in your seat every single week. If by some chance you're not able to catch us on Sunday or you can't get to San Jose, uh, the message remains online for seven days until we get to the next message. So, number one, don't you miss a week. Number two, don't, en don't just enjoy this by yourself. This is the kind of series as we talk about coming home. And we're looking at the, the, the dynamics of our home, whether it be growing up are uh, our current homes that uh, can either undermine us or, if grappled with correctly, can empower us. This is the kind of series that you want people who you love and who are close to you to participate and enjoy and be blessed by this series with you. So invite them to come to San Jose with you. Invite them to, to, to do a watch part in front of the TV, watching us on YouTube, uh, wherever you're watching us from. Share the link. Make sure you engage this. I believe God's going to do something supernatural and special. God, move now. Pour your spirit out afresh on this teaching. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, let's read our text for the day as we get started. Luke chapter 15, verse 11 through 12. This is about Jesus telling this remarkable story. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The youngest son told his father, I want my share of your estate now, before you die. <laughs> You're living too long, Dad. <laughs> so his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. And then the story goes on that the very next day, the son packs up all of his belongings, moves to a distant land, and the text tells us that he spent all of that money on wild living. And then a famine hits, and before we know it, the boy is starving to death. He has to go and hire himself out to a farmer who puts him to work in a hog pen, and he was a Jew, and that is like the most humiliating, worst place you can be. And then the text tells us, there in a the hog pen, tempted to eat with the hogs. This happens. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. You know what? Here's our theme. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against you, against both heaven and you. You know what? I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me as a hired servant. And so he gets up and he begins to head home. And then the text tells us in verse 20. As he was returning home to his father, 
And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, the father broke all of the cultural rules and ran to his son and embraced him and kissed him. And there ends the reading for today. Somebody shout amen and amen. Praise God. Can you say home? The word home invokes for so many of us warm and loving feelings. And yet it is also true that for many of us, we have experienced home not always as a warm and loving place. Often, either in the homes that we grew up in or sometimes in the homes that we're currently living in, those spaces are filled with dysfunction, confusion, pain, sometimes, unfortunately, even violence, and unending cycles of destructive and irresponsible decisions. Engaging these dynamics of dysfunction and, and poor decisions and figuring out how they influence and impact us can either empower our lives in the world or continue, in some cases, to undermine our future. So here is the dilemma that we're trying to answer and wrestle with today, the, the, the conundrum that we're trying to try break open, the, the riddle that we're trying to solve, which is the riddle that we are often trying to solve. It is shaped by the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 8. Here's what he says, love never fails. He's talking about having unfailing love. Here's the question. Here's the riddle. Here's the conundrum. Here it is right here. Simply as this. How do I practice unfailing love with dysfunctional, irresponsible loved ones, regularly hurtful and destructive in their decisions? Can somebody say, how? How? Now notice our scripture today begins with the words, to illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. Jesus is the teacher today. And in case you don't know, Jesus is really, 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 really smart. So if he's teaching, you and I need to pay attention because we can trust his teaching. And that same passage also begins with these words, to illustrate the point further. It's a reminder that Jesus is really talking to and talking about some pretty dysfunctional religious leaders and these are individuals which we discover in verse 1 of this passage who they have no idea, like most of us when we're trapped in our dysfunction, that they had no idea just how dysfunctional and destructive their behavior were. And so, oftentimes this passage is preached and applied to the church house, which is so appropriate but because it is Jesus who's teaching, it is so packed with such extraordinary and incredible insight that the insight is actually useful not only in the church house, but in your house and in my house. Can you say dysfunctional? Yes. The fact is that we all have dysfunctional folk in our homes, our families, among our friends. We, we can all relate to that child, that grandchild, that parent or grandparent uh, who is often irresponsible. Or, or we can relate to that destructive sibling, a cousin, a friend. You know, these are people that we absolutely love. And yet, more times than we would like to acknowledge, they make us go, again. It is into this dynamic that uh, we have to ask the question, what does it mean to have unfailing love in the middle of these circumstances trying to engage with our loved ones? And, you know, sometimes the dysfunctional person may be a surprise. <laughs> in my household, my family and I, my wife and daughter and nephew, we're always teasing each other, just teasing each other. And from time to time... Uh, and, Usually, this kind of goes around. Uh, somebody will say, I'm the only normal person in this house. <laughs> and inevitably, they typically wait till I say it. And they, they tend to point out, listen, Dad, if you're the only normal person in this house, so you think, that means 
that you're the only one who's unlike everybody else. So that might suggest that you are, by definition, abnormal. <laughs> Could you be the dysfunctional one? <laughs> Notice I said daddy, so I'm, get, I'm not calling out no names, but that's all good. That's all good. <laughs> but here's the point. Sometimes it's true, isn't it? Sometimes the dysfunctional one, the one who's at the center of the chaos, because of the trauma that we experienced growing up in our household, in our earlier circumstances, sometimes the dysfunctional one is us. But that's you. I want you to lean in. Because God's got a word of deliverance and healing, a, 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 a bond, bondage-breaking word for you over the course of this series. Don't run away. Lean in. Now, our text begins with this remarkable statement. Jesus tells the story, and he says there's a man who has two sons. I should point out this, this father has actually two dysfunctional sons. I'll talk about the older one in just a minute. The younger son says to his father, I want my share of your estate now, before you die. The rule says, after the death of the father, the estate is divided. The son says, you're living too long. Just give it up right now. <laughs> so, I love this. His father didn't argue, didn't debate. He agreed. The text tells us he went on and made, divided the wealth and let the boy go. Let me say a word about the oldest son. I didn't read far enough down, but before we finish this series, I'm going to talk about the oldest son who is also dysfunctional. But the challenge is, interestingly enough, as it relates to the oldest son, his dysfunction is disguised as faithful obedience. His dysfunction is disguised as the dependable and reliable one. The older brother. Can you say the older brother? We'll return to that in the weeks to come. But the younger son, upon closer examination, the younger son, he's probably the one who more likely than not was the source of conflict and chaos in the house. The younger child, this one is probably the one who was always angry, never satisfied, the rule breaker within the family, the one most likely regularly to leave the family in turmoil. It is the younger son who says, give me mines, I'm out of here. As Jesus describes this younger son, we should be listening because, again, he could be speaking to us. And the text says, so the father agreed. Here's the essence of the lessons of today's message. The father knew when to let go. And here's what I want you to take away as we think about unfailing love in the midst of broken family and broken circumstances. Unfailing love knows when to let go. If somebody's sitting in the room with you or next to you, just tell them unfailing love knows when to let go. Knows when to let go. Now, let me just say a word very quickly about the son, because, I, again, I've got somebody watching me that fits the, regardless of your gender, fits the profile here, potentially, of the son. And I just want to say a word. I'm not going to really teach about him today. You're going to come back over the next few weeks. But let me just point out, Jesus is teaching, and he, he lays out this, this profile of the son. I want you to listen closely. Number one, the son is a person who makes poor choices regularly. We see him making poor choices in this text. He asks for his father's his part of the father's estate long before that boy is mature enough to manage it. Then a few days later, he, the text tells us that he packs all of his belongings and moves to a distant land. And there, check it out, he wasted all of his money on wild living. Poor choices. And then he encounters unexpected and horrific circumstances, as life is often prone to do. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land. The bottom in that agricultural context fell out. And suddenly, this young man found himself having landed in the midst of some horrendous consequences that was all about generated because of the poor choices he made. He woke up one day, he was friendless, homeless, jobless, and foodless. And in addition to that, 
a young Jewish young man ended up having to hire himself out to a farmer who sent him out into the fields to work among the hogs, the worst place for a Jewish person to work because to touch and be engaged with hogs was to be considered unclean. And it was the lowest point of humiliation. So this young man ends up in a hog pen, verse 16. And it tells us that he was so hungry that he was tempted to eat what the hogs were eating. Here he was in a hog pen of shame and misery and failure. But did I tell you that it's Jesus that's teaching the text? Did I tell you? And, and, and when you look at the story, look at what Jesus teaches you. Here's what Jesus teaches us about the young man, and it gets me excited. Jesus says, come on now, that if you're with, if you understand that he's with you, that, 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 that he has a he has a tendency of showing up in hog pens. Come on now. You will understand that even in a hog pen, you still got hope. You, you will understand that miracles happen in a hog pen. Yeah, Jesus is teaching right now that you should never believe the messages of your misery. Your misery will tell you that you've gone one mistake too far, that, that, that it's all over now, that your failure is final. But Jesus, as he teaches this text, makes it clear through what happens with this younger man that no, no, if you preside, using last week's message, over your mind and recognize that his love, come on now, shows up in hog pen situations, come on. Your current misery is simply positioning you for a future miracle. Tell somebody there's hope in the hog pen. So that's all I want to say about the young man. I, 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 there's hope in the hog pen. And yet, the verse says he came to himself and his life was set free. But none of this would have happened, Jesus would have you to know, just by how he tells the story. None of this would have happened had not the father recognized when it was time to let the young man go. You see, faithful love realizes that there are times when we need to let folk we love go. How does the father reach this incredible point where he's ready to let him go? Well, he did some reasoning. Let's look, if you will, just for a few moments at the father's painful realizations that he ultimately came to. It's really set up here in Luke chapter 15, verse 17. It is really a surprise to see this in the verse. In Luke 15, 17, it says, when the young man finally, can you say finally, finally came to his senses. All the while, until we read this verse, we think that the young man is in his right mind, although he's making some poor choices. But the reader would have us, and Jesus, who's telling the story, would have us to know, no, that's not the case. The young man has been in a place of temporary insanity. I was talking to somebody the other day, and they were telling me about a situation that they were engaged in, and they said that the person that they were dealing with was just, you know, that, that the behavior was just an insane behavior, and, 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 and they couldn't understand uh, this behavior. And I said to them, well, of course, insanity by definition is something that you and I logically cannot understand. And so let me put it another way. What the father knew all along, what he had realized all along, is that he could not reason with the unreasonable. That was the first realization that told him perhaps it's time to let this fellow go because he had become unreasonable. He couldn't reason with him. You know, the father could have chosen to use the money as a manipulative tool. He could have chosen to use the money as a punishment uh, to say, I'm not going to give you this because. But he knew that at the end of the day, none of that was going to impact or affect for the better this young man who was in a state of unreasonableness, temporary insanity. The second realization the father comes to is that he could not impart maturity. And the problem that this young man had, probably a young adult, 
was that, come on now, he, 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 had, he was living in a great place. He had all of the resources. The one thing he was missing was maturity. He, he, he was behind the times in his maturity. Now, here's what the father realized, and he teaches us this today. Listen, uh, he teaches us that, 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 that you can, uh, let me put it this way, I can instruct you, I can inform you with knowledge, but I can't mature you. There's no button I can push to make you mature. Maturity, by definition, is the result of knowledge in combination with lived experience that's well processed. You, you, you need some lived experience. Come on now. And you need the faculty to step back and process. And then the knowledge that has been poured in you begin to make sense. Well, that's maturity. The father realized that it was time to let go because he realized that his son had reached the point where dad needed to create some space for the boy to test the boy's hypothesis. The hypothesis that the young man had was that even in his immature state, he knew more than his daddy. And so dad had to create space for the boy to test it, y'all. <laughs> the dad had to create some space for the boy to run his own experiment. Come on, using his life, come on, investment and his life as the guinea pig. The boy concluded that at the end of the day, if I've got money, I've got friends, I've got fun, and who needs anything else? No recognition of the unexpected. Here's what my grand aunt used to say. Some of you recall these, and the older people who raised me back in Cachetta, uh, they would say stuff like this. Bought sense is better than taught sense. <laughs> they would say stuff like, some folk don't believe fat meat is greasy. Uh, they would say, some folk don't miss the water until the well run dry. And in the lives, in our lives, some, some of the people we're dating, some of the folk who are our siblings, some of the folk who are our grandkids, that, 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 that we need to have the wisdom of the Father, y'all ain't listening, and realize that we need to step back and create space for the well to run dry so that experience can do what our words will never do. The third realization that the father had about his son that uh, positioned him in, or in a place where he could say, this is the time to let him go, is that when he, he thought about it, he knew that if he let the boy go, that the son may never return. Now, he wasn't confused about this. Uh, the son may never return just because of his immaturity. He may just turn his back on the family. In fact, his actions suggested that. But also, the son may never return because his destructive decisions might end up in a situation where he actually loses his life. The father was not oblivious to this. But, but the father reasoned like this. Listen to this now. This is how the father thought about it. The father chose to prioritize the best possibility for his son's future over the reality of the father's worst pain. Did you hear what I said? That, 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 that he, he concluded that the, the, the best hope the child has is that I let him go. And, 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 and I'm going to let him go even though recognizing that he might get killed, even though recognizing, come on, that I may never see him again. And so it's going to keep me up at night. It's going to break my heart. I'm going to cry some lonely days. But I, 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 I'm not going to allow my emotional context to undercut my responsibility to do what's right by my son. And what he needs me to do is to let him go. This was the time that the father decided to let the boy go because the father knew this. <laughs> if he let the boy go, it was an exercise of unfailing love. If he tried to hold on to it, unfailing love would become failing love. By trying to keep the boy and protect the boy and rescue the boy, that, 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 that the love that he has for the boy would fail the boy. Unfailing love requires letting go. 
How did the father, what was it that was unique about the father that allowed him to do this kind of healthy reasoning so that he ultimately could reach the conclusion to let the boy go, even though it was going to break daddy's heart? Well, the father had self-awareness. And I want you to know today, self-awareness is indispensable to knowing when to let go. Awareness of yourself. Listen, my mother-in-law says regularly, she's in her mid-70s, she's lived a lot, seen a lot. She says, you know what? People just don't know themselves. And by that she means we don't have self-awareness. And that is true for a lot of people. But listen to me. It's true by way of default, not by design. God has designed us and given us a brain. Come on now. And, and, and in conjunction with his word, uh, uh, if, if we allow God to have his way, uh, the, the, the whole design is for us to keep discovering ourselves. Yeah, I hate to admit this, but this is absolutely true. And when I met my wife, she was uh, 17 uh, and I was 20, 21, both at college. She came early. She talked to me for about three hours. And after the three hours, the first date, if you had asked her, she could have written a dissertation on Herman Hamilton because she, uh, she, she intuitively understood me. As a matter of fact, she understood me better than I understood me. And I had been living with me for 20 or 21 years. <laughs> <laughs> that is the reality, guys. I'm trying to get you to see that some of us are 20 and 30 and 40 and 50 years and older, and we've been living with ourselves, and yet we have no self-awareness. Self-awareness. All right, here, here's what's unique about the Father and the story that Jesus is telling. That in the story that Jesus is telling, it is absolutely clear who's the Father and who's the son? In the story that Jesus is telling, there is absolutely no ambiguity about which one is mature and which one is immature. In, in, in the story that Jesus is telling, uh, we don't have to struggle to pick out who's the healthy one in the story and who's the unhealthy one in the story. The challenge for many of us as we think about the home dynamics that have shaped our lives and some of the entangled relationships that we're in is that when we, and I'm talking as a pastor who have pastored for over 30 years, and, and I'm talking about stories of people that I know, come on now, that, that, that there are some folk when I look at them, I, I, I don't know who's the healthy one and who's the unhealthy. And years ago, I was counseling a father who was bankrolling his daughter's irresponsible living behavior. And she had a job, she uh, should have been financially secure, given the amount of money she made. She was reckless with her money, and, and she'd call him up and say, Dad, I need help paying my mortgage, and, and he'd pay it. A couple months later, she's reckless with her money. Dad, I'm, about to, I'm having trouble with the card note, and he'd pay it. So in a pastoral context with me, he says to me, I don't know, my, my daughter's got a problem. I said, well, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's not clear to me who has the problem. I, I can't tell from this scenario, since you, you are, you, come on, you're bankrupt. I can't tell who's the healthy one and who is the unhealthy one. See, because at the end of the day, he was so tangled up emotionally, come on, with, he could not differentiate, he could not distinguish <laughs> A healthy role from an unhealthy role. You know why? Because, and I told him, listen, here's the deal. You're not doing what you're doing because you love her. You're doing what you're doing because you love you. You can't handle the pain of saying no to her. So to soothe your emotions, come on now. Y'all ain't listening to me. You ain't listening to me. Come on. I, I, I've known parents, I can't distinguish the parent from the child. Uh, so interested in being a friend, so afraid of the child, the teenager being angry, that they forfeit their right to parent, to be something other than a parent. Here's the problem. 
Your children can get friends elsewhere. They have to come to you for a parent. Sometimes it's confusing. So let me give you a tool as I wrap this up to help you do the work of self-awareness. Because the more aware of ourselves, the better and the more capable we are of making tough decisions like letting go. The tool, and psychiatrists call this tool, self-differentiation and the ability to make distinctions and draw appropriate boundaries. Here's the definition that I wrote, kind of a layman definition. It's the capacity to identify your own thoughts, feelings, and values and distinguish them from others. Watch this. It is the process of not losing connection with yourself, what you feel, what you value. Come on now. While being able to stay in deep connection with others, but not to get kind of soaked up in them so deep that you lose yourself. So you've got to do the work, come on now, of what they call self-differentiation, of of distinguishing, drawing a boundary between your, uh, come on, between your world and theirs. Let me me give you some questions that you should be able to ask in order to draw the right boundaries. Number one, you you need to be asked, what are my values? And how are they different from my husband or my spouse or my children or my parents? Come on now. Or my best friend. Come on. What, 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 what are my values? The father understood that his son's values was different than his values. That, 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 that the son was rejecting faithfulness. The son was walking away from the family responsibility. The, the, the son had a different set of values. And, and, and the, because the father was clear about it, come on now, he was able to make a good decision. The, uh, you need to ask, what are my emotions? The father was aware of his emotions. And he could draw a boundary between his emotions and that of his son. Let me quick story as we bring this to a close. My grand aunt was, was, was notorious, was effective at this thing. I, was, I remember I wanted to play football. I, I wanted to be the Pittsburgh Steelers' Lynn Swan and as a freshman in high school. And my grand aunt said no because she knew me better than I knew myself. I had no self-awareness, but she did. And she said, if I let you go out there, uh, you will probably end up in a stretcher and paralyzed. No. And then the next year, she said, let's wait till next year. But the next year, the school rebuilt. In other words, God got involved. And, 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 and only freshmen, and I was a 10th grader. And then the following year, come on, only freshmen and 10th graders, and I was 11th grader. And it's just, I could never play. My grandmother told me after my grandaunt died that my grandaunt shared with her that on more than one occasion that she would exercise that kind of discipline, that she would say a hard no, and she would see me weeping, and she would see the experience of pain that would come to me. Uh, But she would never let me know it, but she would go in her own room, and she would weep, and she would cry. Come on now. But I never knew it because she she was self-aware. She she, she knew how to, to, to differentiate, to draw boundaries between what she felt and what I needed. Somebody listening to me today, you need to ask yourself questions about what are my fears. The the father was completely clear about his fears. And then he could make the decision that he was, he would, he would, come on now, uh, he would, he would own his fears, but he would lean on his faith. Oh, God. <laughs> and then finally, uh, you need to be asked the question, what is my reality? Because your reality may not be the same. Listen, dad's reality was not the same as that boy's reality. And the only way for that boy to come around, y'all ain't listening, dad had to be clear, I need to let him go. He can have the appropriate experience. Here's my last point. I'm out of time, guys. I hope you got it. I hope this has been helpful to you. Unfailing love keeps trusting God even when we can't trust our loved ones. Without doubt, the the father had closed the door, but he he left his heart unlocked. Without doubt, uh, the father was 
praying, and I, in my, in my, my sanctified imagination, I can see him on his knees. God, let your grace overtake my boy. And I can see the grace of God showing up in the context of the boy's life in the midst of the crisis and showing up in that, in that hog pen. And, and I can see the grace of God, come on now, snapping the synapse in his brain. <laughs> the, the, the neurons begin to fire afresh. And the boy begins to make connections that he hadn't made before. And then the boy says, let me come. He comes to his senses and he says, why am I here when I could be there? Why have I walked away from blessings? Come on. Only to put myself in a catastrophic situation. And then he gets up and he begins to go home. And because the father had closed his door but left his heart unlocked, and he was stationed in a place of faith. He was looking and he saw the boy come down. And the text says that as the boy returned home, come on, I can't guarantee you every time that the boy is going to return home. I can't guarantee you that life, come on now, will not, will not bring the wrong tragedy because, because at the end of the day, we have free will and we have to respond to the grace of God. But what I can tell you that if it is godly possible, God will make a way the boy is returning home to his father. And while he was still a long way away, his father, who had been looking for him and praying for him and believing God for him, I don't know, weeks maybe, months maybe, years, he saw the boy coming home, y'all, come on. And he breaks his cultural and his male stereotypes and he pulls up his garment and he runs out and he throws his arms around the boy. It is a remarkable thing at this moment that we need to remember that the father depicted in that story is God. And he was saying, welcome home. Amen. Amen. 